Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenos días. Buenos días tengan todos ustedes. Bienvenidos ya al cuarto día de este Global Veterinary Meeting. Eh, un ciclo de, de pláticas muy buenas, muy interesantes, componentes eh, internacionales. Y bueno, pues para muestra un botón, hoy nuestro invitado pues va a transmitir directamente desde Turquía. Entonces, eh, pues es un placer para nosotros participar de este proyecto que une a toda Latinoamérica y Europa. Algo muy importante este, que debo comentarles es, uno, que se, se pasen por la liga que se está compartiendo eh, por los medios de Batuk, de Koji y de Skenda para que puedan registrar sus datos y de esta manera puedan estar recibiendo eh, información acerca de próximos eventos, ¿no? Esto por un lado. Por otro lado, también quiero comentarles que eh, nuestro ponente del día de hoy, eh, pues va a dictar su plática en inglés, por lo cual les pedimos que al final en las preguntas y respuestas hagan sus preguntas en inglés, ¿de acuerdo? Si es posible, para que se las podamos este, leer y, y bueno, no perder tiempo en temas de traducción. ¿Sale, vale? Así es de que vayan practicando su inglés. Por ahí abran su traductor de Google. <risa> este, para que podamos seguir haciéndolo eh, pues más fácil, ¿no? ¿De acuerdo? Bien. Antes de comenzar, vamos a enlazarnos con Julio Morales para que nos platique qué, qué onda, qué viene con el Global Veterinary Meeting. Hola, Julio. Hola, Isra. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. ¿Tú? Bien, bien, aquí, aquí en la lucha también. Muy bien, <risa> platícanos Julio. Bueno, eh, pues primero que todo darles un saludo a todos eh, los asistentes, a los miembros de la comunidad Batuk, a los miembros de la comunidad eh, Koji y a los miembros de la comunidad Esquenda. Eh, nosotros sabemos pues que en estos momentos es complicado levantarse temprano, pero hemos tenido un gran, una gran acogida. Eh, no me voy a demorar mucho en la introducción porque pues hoy tenemos uno de los pesos pesados en Europa, eh, miembro de la Sociedad Europea de Urgencias. Esperamos que, que aprovechen mucho esa plática del día de hoy. Eh, recordarles que nos sigan en las redes sociales, Oji, Batuk, Esquenda, y va a salir mucha información de los cursos que vienen a, a continuación. Son cursos de pocas personas. Ya sabemos que no pueden eh, haber muchas aglomeración de personas en, en esta época. Y pues aprovechar, sabemos que, que, que la, la comunidad y los, los médicos veterinarios en este momento están necesitando mucho la parte práctica. Entonces, eh, todas estas pláticas y todo eso que se está brindando se va a, a dictar práctica, eh, con su práctica pues, el doctor Seralf eh, va a estar también agendando una fecha para Latinoamérica, entonces pues bueno, eh, simplemente invitarlos a que nos sigan en las redes sociales, eh, esta noche vamos a tener al doctor Ignacio Cordero desde Chile, para que también esté muy pendiente, y bueno, eh, sin más preámbulos, darle gracias al doctor Ceral y nos vemos más tarde. Gracias. Muy bien, Julio, pues muchísimas gracias. Y bueno, hay que, vamos a estar pendientes de lo que va sucediendo con este Global Veterinary Meeting. ¿De acuerdo? Y bien, les voy a presentar a nuestro invitado de esta mañana, de jueves. Él es el doctor Ceral Usun. De acuerdo con el tema de presentación basada en casos de trauma múltiple, enfoque del paciente. Nacido en Estambul en el año de 1972, después de graduarse de la universidad, continuó su educación en la Facultad de Medicina Veterinaria de la Universidad de Estambul y se graduó en el año de 1998. Espérenme. Debido al interés en la cirugía y atención crítica de emergencia veterinaria, solicitó el doctorado en la Facultad de Medicina Veterinaria de la Universidad de Bucarest y comenzó su investigación sobre bioimplantes en 2015. 
Después de su experiencia de ocho años en emergencias, es el fundador y primer presidente de la Asociación Turca de Urgencias Veterinarias y Cuidados Críticos, Tubeca, en 2016. Dio conferencias y talleres sobre emergencias con diferentes invitaciones como ponente para veterinarios. Ha sido profesor de triage y procedimientos de emergencia en la Facultad de Veterinaria de la Universidad de Ankara y en los congresos de estudiantes de la Facultad Veterinaria de Murdur, de Burdur Mac, Macubet, perdón, en 2018. Ha sido profesor sobre los tipos de oxigenación en ESC, procedimientos de ER torácicos paso a paso para principiantes, tubos de alimentación en cuidados críticos, trauma múltiple, por dónde empezar, qué hacemos bien y qué puede ir mal, en la Facultad de Veterinaria de la Universidad Selkuk. Además de sus acciones en el campo de emergencia veterinaria, también ayudó a los estudiantes de veterinaria turcos a tener instalaciones para realizar prácticas de verano en Rumania. A principios de 2019 publicó su, libro, su primer libro de SC, escrito en turco, llamado Guía de Procedimientos de Emergencia y Cuidados Críticos de Medicina Veterinaria en Turquía. En enero de 2019 fue elegido para la Comisión de Relaciones Públicas de EBEX y comenzó a construir proyectos con otros miembros de la comisión. Actualmente continúa su trabajo en el campo de emergencias veterinarias como cirujano y presidente honorífico de Tubeca y en progreso su carrera académica en la Facultad de Medicina Veterinaria de la Universidad de Bucarest en el Departamento de Cirugía. Les recuerdo, al final las preguntas se van a formular en inglés. Les pedimos que las escriban en inglés. ¿De acuerdo? Un placer recibir aquí al doctor Seralp Usun. Hello. Hola, hello, hello, doctor. How are you? I am fine, uh, Mr. Israel. How are you? Fine, thank you. Welcome, welcome. And when you are ready, go. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, I hope you everybody see the, the screen. No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, so first, let's uh, share the screen and then make it bigger. Now you see? Yes, yes, we see it. Okay, perfect. So first of all, I'm so thankful uh, to the organization, to you and for this uh, and the great friend and uh, to the Dr. Julio Morales for uh, inviting me this uh, and being uh, the part of this great event. I'm so thankful and uh, hopefully uh, I will, uh, in, everybody will enjoy the presentation. Before we uh, start the uh, presentation, uh, this is uh, today is 23 April and it is the National Sovereignty uh, Day in Turkey, uh, which is dedicated to the children by uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the builder of Turkish Republic. And uh, I just wanted to start with his great words that peace at home, peace in the world. So after that, <clears throat> If we jump to the multiple trauma, multiple trauma patients are the most challenging emergencies because while we are trying to find most primary problem of the patient and we must at the same time, we must initially stabilize the patient as you see in the pictures because hit by car can cause head trauma with diaphragmatic hernia as you see uh, here in the cat that hit by car with a head trauma and diaphragmatic hernia, or you can also have diaphragmatic hernia caused by hit by car can combine with rib fractures or failed chest. When I see this first case, the second case of the dog, I thought to myself that these dogs uh, were heart beating out of the body. So these are the most, most uh, important cases and most challenging cases. That's why uh, the multiple traumas are very important for us. We will talk about also Mishu, the cat, uh, which is high-rise syndrome, 
Baju hit by a car and Rolly at the end beaten by a Rottweiler in the park. We will come back there, but uh, before we should ask to ourselves, I, are we really ready for multiple uh, trauma emergencies? I mean, is everything ready and everything essential ready in our clinics? So the goal is to prevent from redundant time lost. Do we have emergency room? Do we have a crash card? Is everything designed systematically? Do we have drug doses on the wall, which will help us very much? And except these, do we really have a plan? So everything starts with a trained receptionist and the phone triage. The phone triage and the receptionist should be very calm and knows how to direct the owner, give the exact information to the team leader and the medical team. Nobody wants us, for example, you are in the clinic, you are busy and the receptionist comes to you and saying that, doctor, in 20 minutes, we will receive an emergency trauma case and uh, uh, with a wound. And as you ask her or him, where is the wound? And you don't want to, and she replies, if she replies that, I don't know, this doesn't work. For this reason, uh, the team must always ask cl close questions to the owner and be specific and pointed. And do not forget, the owners are not veterinarian doctors. I mean, for example, if the receptionist is asking to the owner if they can receive the uh, pulse rate and the owner asks, how can I find it? And you should not say that uh, arterial femoralis because they are not veterinarian. So you need to uh, ask them to how to find out the pulse. The second thing, which is very important, the medical team. Even the ideal team should have five person, one team leader, doctor, second the assistant doctor, and then comes the uh, assistant nurse or technician and the second nurse and technician. And the fifth person should have the, uh, the one who is taking the notes. Even this, the ideal number for dealing with dramas is minimum five, but we can make it three, two, if we don't have enough people in our team. And the most important thing is the team should work on model cases and should have having plans. What is the plan? So the plan is going like that. When we are approaching to the uh, trauma patients, always we check airway, circulation, respiratory, abdomen, spine, head, pelvis, limbs, arteries, veins, and nerves, which we call a crash plan. We must examine the patient, each of the patients in detail. I mean, detailed inspection should be performed, external or even uh, internal injuries. We need to clip the fur to see the bruises. Do not forget the hypoxia and hemorrhage are two of the main causes of death in trauma patients. And also, do we have any penetrating injuries? So Mishu, I told you, high rise syndrome, 24 hours before, falls down the balcony, fourth floor, goes to a local clinic, one x-ray provided, analgesia with IM, IM, and then discharge. The cat didn't eat at that night. It's okay, it can be maybe at home, but in the, in the morning, the owner found uh, Mishu in, uh, with the respiratory distress and some crackle voices when he wants to hold Mishu and they come to the hospital around noon time. Always we need to stick on, uh, stick on ABC. Even the last fashion uh, modifications had been added. We must always keep in mind ABC. Do we have any obstructions in the area? What about the breathing type? What about if do we have bleeding? And always check the vitals first. So if we talk about A, the airway and the arterial bleeding, do we have again any obstructions on the air in the airways? Do we have bleeding there? What about the respiratory rate and the character? 
What about the mucous membranes color? Are they cyanotic? Are they uh, pale? What about capillary refill time? Because capillary refill time can address an ongoing bleeding in our patient. And please do not forget and do not wait for the oxygen, just deliver it. If you go to be breathing, the respiratory rate and the character is very important for us too, for the define the problem. The movement and the shape of thorax, like in this brachiocephalic breathe. Do we have rib fractures or failed chest? Do we have diaphragmatic hernia? Do we have pneumothorax or hemothorax? And lung sounds, are they normal? Before going to perform A fast or T fast, we should not forget to listen the lungs with our stethoscopes that always staying in, on, on our shoulders, in our neck. Back to the issue, vitals. Respiratory rate were 42 BPM, capillary refill time were two, mucous membranes were cyanotic, heart rate 156 BPM, no bleeding, no wounds. She wa he wasn't alert and he wasn't having interest on surroundings. So we ha have severe emphysema and we delivered oxygen by mask. We couldn't have the IV excess, our uh, anesthetist uh, gave alfoxone and then we could able to have IV excess and she also uh, put buprenorphine on the uh, mission. X-rays taken while ongoing oxygen delivery. I don't know what you are seeing here, but I see a cat in a blue. As you see the huge emphysema and pneumothorax and collapsed lung were our first primary problems. <clears throat> so we intubated Mishu right away. We placed a chest tube, sorry. We placed definitely two chest tubes from one side and to the other side. And things can surprise you when you cut the black fur of a cat in the axillary region, especially. As you see on the picture, I find out a small, 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 tiny wound, which is really three to four millimeters. We prepared the emergency surgery. We just enter it. And as you see, now it's bigger than one centimeter. And my finger can see that I was in uh, the thorax of the cat. So always, always, always check the wounds, where they are going, where they are ending. Go back to circulation, heart rate and the rhythm and the pulse rate quality. Is it weak? Is it strong? It do, does uh, pulse rate have correlation with heart rate? What about again, capillary refill time? ECG connected? And always I prefer to uh, place two IV catheters in these trauma patients. And if we do not have IV excess, do we have to perform uh, intraosseous catheter or wing cut down or central venous catheter? These are important too. About disability, we need to check our patient's mental status. Is he alert? Is he paralyzed? Is, do we have spinal injuries? Here you see the Glasgow Coma Scale that being provided for human medicine emergencies. And uh, nowadays they modified to veterinary medicine, which you can uh, download it from uh, Google it and you can download it and you can uh, put it in your clinic, which will be very useful paper. The other, and useful paper is animal trauma triage, ATT, which you can check perfusion, cardiac, respiratory, eye, muscle, skeleton, and neurologic signs, and you can score them. This is released by Journal of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care in 2007. And if you can also Google it and download it as a PDF and put in your papers in your clinic, which is very useful, for scoring your trauma patients. We need to have answers in trauma patients. Does our patient have adequate ventilation? Is ventilation and perfusion balanced in our patient? 
Do we need to place tracheostomy tube? Do we need it immediately? Do we have pneumothorax or pleural effusions? And what about thoracosynthesis? Do we have external bleeding? Can we place IV catheter? If not, IO, CDV, or CVC catheters? And what about the fluid requirements of our patient? Does the patient need immediate surgery? It's also important. And then total blood analysis and USGs and X-rays coming. We have Bachu, as I told you, hit by car, three years old, Caucasian shepherd, very aggressive, no open wound, no external bleeding. He cannot even stand up. For this reason, he cannot walk. Hospital entrance was in the early in the morning around uh, 6.30 a.m. We sedated him, oxygen delivered, IV catheters placed. The blood tests were really normal and we perform IV fluids and while oxygenating, we had the X-rays. So in the X-rays, we had coxophemeral luxation with diaphysis oblique fracture of the tibia and we just planned the surgery for the next day. Here, I want to give a break about surgeries because it's also very important in trauma patients that the timing of the surgery. What we know, all the papers and the research says that in multiple trauma patients, especially, if we perform surgery earlier than 24 hours, we will have the great uh, mortality numbers. But on the other hand, if we delay the surgery, too much than 24 hours, let's say 72 hours, again, the mortality rates are getting high. So really it's important about when we are planning the time of the surgery. And the second thing, which is very important from where we will start. I mean, are the bones are important or the organs are important, which is much more life-threatening for our case. So as I told you, we uh, planned the surgery for the next day. But look, in the next day, in the surgery day, Baju respiration status was not stable and the SpO2 level dropped to 89 percentage. So, and we performed AFAS and AFAS said pneumothorax I have. And we right away placed the chest tube and we delayed the surgery. So in these cases, I just uh, can advise you always check your patient in the morning after you plan the surgery. Always have a uh, second AFAST or second X-ray. We need to check after thorax, we need to check. Always rule out trauma from abdominal organs. Highly important to be always suspicious about abdomen in trauma patient. We must think about if there is an acute hemorrhage on going on. What about spleen ruptures? Are kidneys okay? Do we have, uh, is the urinary bladder is okay? Is there an rupture? What about urethra? Is gallbladder fine? What about the liver and GI tract assessment must have been provided in these cases? Do we need abdominal synthesis? Do we need to perform peritoneal lavage? What about performing a fast now? And again, once more, do we need to perform laparotomy urgently? And always rule out, as I told you, abdominal hemorrhage. As I mentioned about these things in the abdomen, spleen ruptures, in the hemorrhage, I can tell you that this cat with a blunt trauma with no external bleeding, but when we opened and saw three pieces of uh, spleen in the, after the trauma, we always uh, focus on uh, the fractures on the skeleton because we want, we have fractures and we want to fix them. It's normal. We are placing colorful titanium plates or the other uh, things on the bones. It's okay. But are we ruling out other things? For example, in this case, uh, hit by car, again, we had fractures on pelvic region. And I just 
place the catheter and send a barium sulfate. And as you see, is this a ureteral rupture? Yes, it was an ureteral rupture. The surgery, first we started fixing the urethra and then we fixed the bones. Our kidney is okay. So on, on the right of the screen, is this a artery rupture of a kidney? Yes, definitely. After another blunt trauma, again, trust me, no external wound, no external hemorrhage. We had this uh, kidney artery rupture in a cat. So we will go by with Rolly now. Rolly is uh, six years old, Yorkshire Terrier, goes out to a park, wants to play with a uh, Rottweiler, but the Rottweiler says, no man, I will not play with you. And the, at the end, this love ends with uh, multiple traumatic wounds. And Rolly came to the hospital at noon time. Probably all of you were fan of this great movie uh, with Bruce Willis Die Hard series because the second one was with this Think Fast, Look Alive, Die Harder. That's a fantastic movie with the actor Bruce Willis. But I want to talk with Rolly this time, which is another great actor. So Rolly came, show up us to type now, tachycardia, hemorrhage in the mouth, hemorrhage on the neck, emphysema, and huge abdominal pain. SpO2 level was 90, heart rate was 160 ppm, pulse rate was 158, correlating with heart rate, and uh, respiratory rate was uh, 45 breath per minute. He was mild to uh, going to hypothermia with 37 uh, degrees Celsius. Our anesthetist provided butorphanol, we sedate him, oxygen delivered, and IV catheters, as we always do. Then we had the blood, and we send it to blood analysis for full blood analysis. We are waiting then. While waiting, we provided a fast and no free fluid in the abdomen. Thanks, God. We are going to x-rays. But before we are going to x-rays, we receive the blood analysis. Here is Rolly's um, biochemistry panel in the first side. And then we have the hemolocogram. Everything is upside down. But in these kind of cases, I check three things at first. Red blood cells, HCTs, and thrombocytes. So the book says that while even they are going down about hematocrit level, if it is going downer than 20, you can make blood transfusion, which is really blood, uh, book knowledge. But in emergencies, mm, sometimes it is different because I don't want to uh, wait and I don't want to pray God, okay, I missed to uh, blood transfusion but what happens to my patient half an hour later? So we provided blood tests, uh, blood uh, transfusion. What we know, most seen blood groups in dogs are DEA11 and DEA12. Those patients create natural anticoagulants and for those no antigens identified. This is also blood knowledge, uh, book knowledge, sorry. Which means that as a principle, in emergency, generally we do not see reactions against the first blood transfusion, which again means that if I do not have a proper matched blood, I can perform the first blood transfusion. So I did it. And while uh, we have the x-rays, so what Rolly had, emphysema on the head, emphysema on the dorsal body, mandibular fractures on the left side and the right side, hemorrhage and emphysema in uh, tracheal and the esophageal region. Of course, we took him to surgery. And as I mentioned, always see the penetrated wounds, how deep they are, where it goes, where 
but it ends as a cliche. Do not forget the other side of the iceberg. In the surgery, we fix the fractures, hemorrhage taken under control in muscles that being penetrated, emphysema taken under control with uh, un emphysema taken under control after suturing the trachea and transfusion finished in a couple hours. So we provided notes to our ICU doctors with tramadol, with antibiotics and ringer simple for 24 hours. And we wrote analgesia can be re-evaluated due to patient stabilization and pain, continue oxygen delivering, monitoring the cardiac status, check the vitals in each hour, which is very important again, and the bandage control. Everything seems to be all right, but what about feeding your patient after the trauma? So what we know, mandibular fractures or in a normal time, uh, taking out some teeth or oral cavity surgeries after that and trauma patients and even some patients with functional GI, but they are anorexic, it is mandatory to place feeding tubes. How we place them, we have nasogastric tubes, we have esophagostomy tubes, we have gastrotomy tubes. So the next day, because of the trauma on the tracheal and the esophageal region, we decided not to place an esophagostomy tube. And on the other hand, about nasogastric tubes, trust me, it is much more painful for the, especially in cats, than esophagostomy tubes. But this case was very different case. So we decided to, uh, perform, uh, to place the gastrostomy tube, which our colleague uh, uh, can place endoscopically. So I called the doctor in the morning and I said, okay, doctor, I have this case. Can you place the gastrostomy tube? And he said, yes, please send the case to me. And meanwhile, while I was talking on the phone, the, my colleague from the radiology came to me and said, doctor, we have a problem, you know? And I was thinking, okay, uh, Rolly got some uh, respiratory issues in the x-ray, but uh, in the uh, radiology, but she said, no, nope. we have a foreign body in the stomach. Oops. So this small, tiny circulage somehow in the surgery went under the thong then Rolly swallowed it and it just went to the stomach. And then I call my colleague again and I said, hey, doctor, you know, can you do a favor to me while placing the gastrostomy tube? Can you just take out that tiny piece for me, please? And he said, yeah, okay, we can do it, no worries. So, but before going that, I want to show you this about Trekker because we want him to uh, see the hemorrhage areas on the trachea too. So you, he, you can see the bite wounds on trachea. With the three spots, hemorrhage, areas. And here, I want to show you another something that you will recognize. Check here. It's working. But this side says, mm, I will not work. So as I told you, I told to my colleague to take out the uh, foreign body now, and before placing the gastrostomy tube, he will replace the, uh, take out the foreign body. And you can see that how tiny it is. Normally we can wait, but how it is struggling because it's already stuck to take it out from there. But I like these endoscopic things. It's like rock and roll.
Yeah. So the uh, foreign body taken out, removed from the stomach, and then gastrostomy tube placed on uh, in the stomach of Rolly. It takes time to place gastrostomy tube. It, it needs skills and you can only uh, perform gastrostomy tube endoscopically. For this reason, uh, I always prefer and uh, endo uh, uh, um, sorry, esophagostomy tube because it's very easy and uh, you can give a the uh, high molecules, big molecules for your patient. But as I told you, Rolly was exceptional. It's what he was really diehard case. So they placed the, uh, the tube. And in the ICU unit, when you are uh, feeding your patient you can see this reflex of tongue, like licking. Always you will see this, you are seeing this. Always, this is wonderful something. That especially in cats, by the way, you can see the wounds here of Rory. Uh, in the cats, in the IC unit, when you uh, feed them, and the, trust me, in the, the second day, when they see you while you are preparing the food and etc. They will start to, uh, mur, 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 you know, cats are thinking like, okay, something is happening. I'm not eating, but this guy is feeding me and I'm feeling full, you know, that's an amazing feeling. And cats are cats. So this is Rolly. Uh, we kept Rolly around uh, 35 days. And this is really on 25th day after the multiple trauma. He was enjoying, he was playing, he was totally recovered, but we just wanted to keep him uh, more 10 days to see, uh, to balance the uh, fluids and etc., minerals and everything. This was a joyful, playful dog who went to park 25 days before and <laughs> wanted to play with Rottweiler. But you know what? <laughs> Even in emergencies, you save the body's life, you know? This is the guy, again, because they are men and always when they feel good after the trauma, even you save the life, they don't care. They always find the nurse to play. So because we are in the quarantine days, uh, in, general, in general, we say take home messages, but uh, I made take quarantine home messages. I wanted to uh, tell you that always uh, make the team members train for ER, even the non-medical team, as I uh, tried to mention in the beginning of this presentation. Always put oxygen on top of the list and never be superficial and always follow up the protocols. Do not fight with a cat for to have a lateral position x-rays because at the end, you can have a perfect x-ray and the dead cat 
on the uh, radiology table. Because with the respiratory distress cats, I really uh, urge you not to have lateral lateral uh, x-rays for a cat. And as I told you, train team for lateral recumbency intubation. It is very important. It is hard, harder than normal intubation, but you, will, you are receiving the patients with the multiple trauma, with the lateral recumbency, with the shock, and you need to just intubate them. So you must train, you must work about lateral intubation with your uh, team members too. Always follow up the penetrating wounds like a detective and do not wait much for the blood transfusion and always watch out for hypothermia after the surgeries in emergencies, especially. And the last thing that I can tell you, always have a mirror in your surgery or emergency room. You will ask this question to me. Okay, Dr. Sev, what the hell is the mirror in the emergency room? Once the great professor came to visit uh, my clinic before I moved to Bucharest uh, in Turkey, and uh, she uh, bring me a gift and I opened the box and I saw a small, tiny, nice frame uh, mirror. And she said, Sarah, I want you to put this mirror in your ER room, which you also uh, make surgeries, but put it next to the door. And I said, why? You know, the mirror, again, mirror in the ER room, why? Because she said to me that after you save life, go to check yourself on the mirror, see you and be proud of yourself. So uh, you should also try this after saving a life, you should see yourself uh, on the mirror and be proud of yourself. At the end, I want to uh, do this. I don't know how to do it, but uh, muchos gracias. I think I, I did it, I hope. I hope uh, I give some examples, uh, some question marks about approaching um, multiple trauma cases, which is very important. So uh, that was it. Thank you very much. Okay, Seralp. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great talk. And uh, we have some questions. Okay, let's have it. Yes. Shall I open the chat? Uh, yes, with your guest. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. uh, your your guests can chat. do it with the uh, question and answers okay. icon. Okay, in the bottom of, of, the, of the screen, yes. Okay, so... Okay, um, okay. we will start. Uh, Anama, Anamafla Osorio, this uh, uh, doctor here in Colombia, we don't have access to Alfaxalon. Do you have any other recommendation for the sedation in these emergency cases? <laughs> it's a very, very nice question. Um, okay, so uh, to be honest, in these cases, in all trauma cases, in all emergency cases, we are so lucky uh, that uh, our anesthetists are dealing with us, are being in our team, checking the, uh, checking the patient with us, and uh, they are doing these sedation protocols or, uh, uh, or the other uh, protocols. So we are so really uh, thank to them and we are so lucky about having uh, these great people in our team. But um, what can I say? Sometimes, not always, but uh, in some cases uh, we use butorphanol. We have bufronophrine and uh, these kind of uh, sedatives we are using. But of course not, uh, we don't use the uh, 
Rompun, it was the label for many years we, we don't use. I don't uh, also um, recommend it because of the, uh, you know, they, they want to vomit and no, it's not so safe. Thank you. You're welcome. Alfredo Medina, can you tell us the basic equipment for trauma urgency? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, if you are thinking to make a, a crash card, I wish you could able to make a crash card and always provide all kind of tubes. But, you know, it's hard to say it, but um, let's say feeding tube. It, that's an amazing tube. Trust me that you can place on chest if you are in emergency, because, you know, in emergencies, if you do not do anything to your patient, you will lose your patient. But if you try and do something for your patient, your patient probably can be saved. For this reason, uh, I always uh, think about these feeding tubes. They are, uh, they are really nice. And you can place them in thorax. You can uh, just use for oxygenation and all kind of tubes. And second, uh, tracheostomy tubes is very important. But even if you do not have tracheostomy tube, proper one, you can check uh, how to make tracheostomy tube uh, from an endotracheal tube. So uh, tubes are very important and the sedatives, all the medications, oxygen. I always say oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. And pulse oximeter, the, the thing that you always need to have. And uh, I think these are the uh, ambu, ambu bag, of course. Uh, but uh, if uh, uh, the doctor needs something much more, I can uh, make a list because I have a list and I can send it to Dr. Julio. So uh, they can receive from Dr. Julio or they can also send me an email so I can send them the proper list. Thank you. You're welcome. Oscar Gizar, excellent lecture. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Too. I Okay, I have one question about Rolly's case. Okay. The decision, the decision of using a gastronomy feeding tube instead of an esophageal feeding tube was because of the trauma in the area. Yes, exactly. That was because of the uh, area esophagus, uh, esoph uh, esophageal and uh, tracheal area. There was uh, there were many hemorrhage lesions and uh, you need to feed your patient as i told you that's why we prefer gastrostomy tube to bypass the line and just feed our patient thank you oscar gizar which highlights do you consider in order to begin blood transfusion i am asking because i have read that you probably won't see change in hct probably until eight hours after blood losses. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. About, yes, the doctor is definitely right. Um, but <clears throat> after the first blood uh, transfusion, uh, we, again, of course, uh, in, the, in the first eight hour, we check the blood tests and uh, if we need the second blood transfusion or not. Uh, we do not uh, like to wait in uh, our emergencies here about blood transfusion to go, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the Rolly case, we do not like to wait too much about dropping uh, to 25 or 20, uh, 20 levels because uh, when they are dropping, your patient getting much more critical. For this reason, we are always providing the blood and uh, as I mentioned, for the first blood transfusion, in general, in general you do not have uh, some reactions. Okay, thanks. Paula Bermudez, 
Thank you, doctor. Why did Rolly receive HCO3? What are the criteria for supplying it? What are the monitoring guidelines? Uh, okay, so I need to uh, open. What was the question? Can you please repeat? Of course. Uh, the first question is, why did Rolly receive HCO3? What are the criteria for supplying it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, HCO3, okay, so H H. Uh, yeah, this was the decision of the uh, of the our team, um, and I just uh, I'm not that much uh, fan of that, and I'm not that much knowledge about that because, as I told you, we are working uh, with a team, and everybody is saying something about uh, supplements and uh, the providing the uh, medicines. For this reason, uh, th th this was our team's decision. Okay, and she she say uh, bicarbonate H C O T. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand. Okay, it's about and also uh, it's about it was about also the uh, kidneys. Our internalists uh, wanted to provide it, and uh, as I told you, and uh, Rolly in Rolly case it was just like that. Okay, and the second question: What are the monitoring guidelines? Okay, so monitoring guidelines is about uh, always we say the um, vitals. It's not only to monitorize the patient with our monitors electronically. I mean, uh, we always check the vitals in each hour in depending on the case and uh, the heart rate, the respiratory rates, and the, we are always checking the SpO2 levels if the, our patient is receiving uh, ventilation is good or not, and how is the uh, oxygen in the blood. And these are the main criteria for us. And always we are checking the breathing type. And uh, these are our main goals, uh, in the, especially in the night shifts after the surgeries. And uh, of course, the cardiac rhythm and the output. Okay, thank you. Nicolas Enriquez, Nicolas Enriquez, this is uh, doctor, how do you manage wounds in your patients? Okay, this is a very nice question too. It's about, uh, okay, the uh, wounds, whoo. <laughs> so uh, it depends on the wound type. Uh, sometimes uh, you can do fancy things, flaps, but as I told you, it's a fancy things. In general, in emergencies, if, they, if the wound is not so big, we just uh, make the basic sutures and uh, provide the uh, skin closure. If there are beats so, and that kind of patients, we are uh, of course uh, going to um, flaps. But the wound management, for example, some, in some wounds, you can do nothing and you go to the basics, as we learned years before, about open wound management. It depends on the wound. Okay, thanks. Paula Bermudez, doctor, okay. do you use a particular pain assessment scale in emergency? Um, okay, if we are talking about, especially in cats, uh, you can also uh, find out, uh, there are some papers, I wish you can find them, Google them, and uh, there are some papers about the cat and the uh, cat's face, and if they are alert, if they're in pain, how they are standing, these are really uh, good signals for us to define the pain. And on the other hand, 
uh, always we are examining and we are always uh, putting our hands on our patients to uh, have the pain uh, management, I mean, to define the pain. And uh, as I showed you in some papers, you can have the uh, trauma patients on the pain uh, scales and you can also uh, check with them. Okay, thank you. Daniel Menendez, do you perform blood serotyping? Mm. <laughs> nice, uh, but it is not directly my uh, job. Yes, they are performing, uh, but uh, I'm, I, it's not directly my uh, duty about that. But our colleagues are doing this. Okay, and his second question of Daniel is so what kits can you recommend it? Sorry, I, I couldn't uh, get the question. If so, what? If so? If so, what kits can you recommend it? Ah, as I, <laughs> the uh, second question is linking with the first question because uh, it is not directly my the duties and our colleagues uh, are dealing with that. Okay, thank you. Cesar yeah. Granados, uh, thanks for, for sharing your knowledge. I mm -hmm. have this observation. In case we doesn't UCI, UCI, what will be our first option to trauma for attending. Okay, so uh, if I misunderstood, please uh, ask me again. It's about the eyes. Uh, here no, say no. UCI. Yeah. And the popped eye, I mean, like okay. in, the, in the cat that I presented. Is it about that? Bueno, si nos comenta César, si te refieres a, a, a lo que comenta el doctor para que pueda contestar. I ask for César. So, mm -hmm. uh, to complete the, the, uh, his question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, while. Um, okay. Magali Zavala, how to manage the owners? Ah, great question. Great question. It is a very important question, trust me. Uh, it's a different something because uh, if you are working with the team and if the surgeon side, you are doing your business inside and somebody really must be uh, in a transfer to the owner and with you. And comes inside the ER room, takes some uh, knowledge and they must inform the owner about ongoing situation. But every time should be calm again, uh, we can inform the owners like, uh, okay, now, uh, for example, Rolly, uh, needs a blood transfusion because he lost really huge amount of blood and uh, our doctors are providing this or uh, we have a splenic uh, rupture so uh, we will take the uh, the patient to the surgery right away always we need to inform uh, directly uh, to the owner and we must be really honest with them uh, what is ongoing uh, about the patient. Because in multiple trauma patients, especially, uh, the, you can lose the patient in right away. And for this reason, the owners need to uh, decide the things. Sometimes uh, you are informing them and uh, especially, for example, I can tell you uh, the cat owners are much more sensitive uh, and they, they are much more sensitive to their cats, which they do not want the pain suffer 
and uh, they can directly uh, want from the doctor when the first observation and we tell them we need to do this, 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 and that, and uh, they can directly uh, want euthanasia because uh, they are very sensitive, which I uh, know. But always keep the communication with the owner on the ongoing uh, situation, as I mentioned, and um, do not let uh, the owners be in the surgery room. And one more thing that I can tell about this uh, from my experiences. Um, all of you had emergencies, all of you had uh, bad cases with blood everywhere, you know, uh, and uh, the patient can die with after CPR even. And uh, what we are doing, to be honest, uh, do not show the owner what is going on there. I mean, like we did this and that and that everywhere is blood everywhere is with the catheters and uh, ECG is working beep 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 and the dog with the or a cat with the blood there on the table it is not fair i i feel like this when you lose the patient which is normal uh, always clean everything what you did everything because you know what you da done and uh, when the, your nurse uh, gives to the inf information to the owner, when uh, he comes or she comes to see their uh, uh, cat or dog, they uh, should see the cat or dog in a clean because that will be the last picture about their, uh, about their friend. So we always respect this to the owners. Thank you, Seralp. In the prior question, uh, I say you see I, but really is, it means uh, I see you, intensive okay, care unit. You. you are talking about ICU unit. Yes. Okay, so uh, what about the ICU unit? Can I take the question? About yes. Uh, I have this observation. In case we don't I see you, what will be our first option to trauma for attending? In case we do not have I see you? Yes. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, hmm. If uh, the doctor is talking about ICU cabin, it's something else. I mean, the, the cabin that provides oxygen and humidity, humidity and, the, uh, and the temperature. If, we, if uh, the doctor is talking about that, it's okay. I mean, you can also provide um, oxygen tents, you know, uh, they, are much more, uh, they are much more cheaper. Uh, they are tents and you can provide uh, supplemental oxygen inside. There are some uh, heating pads and you can have always, please tra in trauma patients, uh, be careful about the fluids to be warm. And there are some small uh, electronic parts that uh, the, uh, the fluid tube uh, goes and uh, that is uh, heating the fluid. You can think about these things. You must, as I told you, in, uh, in hospitalization, always keep an eye about hypothermia. When I was talking with one of my colleagues and he was wondering what we were doing in an ICU or hospitalization in a, after trauma, and I was telling them that, uh, okay, for example, each four hours, in some cases, we are uh, checking the temperature. And he said, really? Each Four hours? I mean, why not in uh, 24 hours? And these kind of things about hypothermia is one of your enemy uh, in trauma cases. Okay, sir, sir, thank you very much. With that questions, we finished the questions session. 
And okay. before we say goodbye, um, we want to hear your final comments, please. Um, I hope, uh, as I mentioned, that I could able to put some highlights uh, in our heads to uh, what we can do, how can we be ready for the trauma cases. I tried to put uh, really uh, some uh, hard cases that you can see. There is no limit. As I showed you, uh, you can have a, a kidney artery rupture, you can have urethral rupture, just uh, you need to be ready about them. And uh, my last words will be again, uh, from tomorrow, when you, if you, you know the lacks of your clinic, when you are trying to buy new stuff, uh, try to buy a small mirror uh, to see yourself after emergencies. Thank you so much, Serap. Thank you so much for We the appreciate uh, really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Gracias. Y eh, bueno, a todos, antes de despedirnos, recuerden que hoy a las 7 de la noche vamos a tener al doctor Ignacio Cordero con el tema tips en el uso de vasopresores perdón, en el paciente séptico directamente desde Chile. Así es de que no se lo pierdan. Seralp, we send you a great hug. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I have your hug. And... Uh... Hello uh, and goodbye to all uh, Latin uh, America. Thank you very much. We see you soon. See you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.